Hello everyone and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc episode number 95. This episode is titled, Should I Get a SPECT Scan? For those of you in the PCS world, those with persistent concussion symptoms, you have likely heard about SPECT scans, you've likely uh, looked into getting a SPECT scan. Um, not the easiest things to come by, but uh, I figured I would I would answer some questions on this because we do get questions from people and it's exactly this question. Should I get a SPECT scan? So first off, just to explain what a SPECT scan is, a SPECT scan is an acronym. It stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. So computed tomography is what is otherwise known as a CT scan. Some people call it a CAT scan. Um, uh, somebody's asking how it's spelt. I can see already. Spec scan. Yes, you've spelt it right, but it's an acronym, so it's all capitalized. S P E C T is a spec scan. It's a type of nuclear image, which means that they inject uh, a radioactive substance into your body, uh, right into the bloodstream, and that radioactive substance will appear on the image. So it's a way for them to be able to um, uh, inject this in and it actually looks at blood flow. Uh, it looks at kind of the metabolic rate of certain tissues because obviously if certain tissues are active, you're going to have more blood flow directed to those particular areas. So really it's a measure of blood flow. Now we know that concussion causes reductions in blood flow in the brain. So this obviously leads us down the path of the idea behind spec scans to actually look at cerebral blood flow. Now spec scans are used in a variety of places other than uh, for detecting cerebral blood flow, but it, it can look at things like tumors, um, it can look at blood flow around the heart. So if somebody has heart disease, they can, they can inject this into your body and they'll analyze the heart to see if there's areas that, are getting, that aren't getting enough blood flow. Uh, it's used to scan infections as well. And more recently, there's some work that's very promising in the Alzheimer's world, being able to uh, look at people's brain scans to be able to determine whether or not they're suffering from Alzheimer or another type of dementia. So uh, some very interesting applications. Now, how does it apply to PCS? As I mentioned, concussion causes a disturbance in cerebral blood flow. So after a concussion injury, we know that it affects the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system affects a whole bunch of different mechanisms that control blood flow to your brain, such as cerebral autoregulation, uh, cerebral vascular reactivity, uh, the, the way your heart rate works, so heart rate variability, which is the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So all of these mechanisms, which are controlled by your autonomic nervous system, control cerebral blood flow. Your brain likes to have the same amount of blood flow. If your brain and oxygen, that's really the main driver. That's the main purpose here is you need the oxygen. If your brain is not getting enough oxygen, you will feel lightheaded and you will faint uh, and go unconscious. You will become confused, all of these different things. So your brain likes to have a consistent amount of oxygen. If there's not a high amount of oxygen in your in your blood, what will happen is your vessels will dilate and it'll try to shunt blood to your brain so that you can have that level of oxygen. So your brain likes to have this thing consistent and it responds to changes in your systemic circulation. So if your blood pressure in your body uh, decreases, your brain has to accommodate to be able to continue to get the same amount of blood. Okay, So it likes everything to be stable and these mechanisms are to ensure that there's stability within your cerebral blood flow. Concussion impairs these mechanisms. So we know from a whole bunch of different studies that have been done, we've done this with Doppler ultrasound, we've done it with fMRI, we've done it with spec scans, we've done it with uh, ASL testing, and we know that concussion and post-concussion syndrome, even patients that have chronic symptoms, do have differences and deficits in their cerebral blood flow. A lot of this research has actually pioneered work from the University of Buffalo because how can we analyze this in a quick and dirty way? It's through a cardiac stress test. We put you on a treadmill and we slowly ramp up your exertion levels to try and find out 
does this increase your symptoms? The idea being that if you have altered cerebral blood flow, your brain mechanisms can't respond to an increase in physical load and you will start to become symptomatic again. So a nice way of testing this from a clinical standpoint is through the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. The researchers at the University of Buffalo have done a lot of work in analyzing cerebral blood flow and this autonomic dysregulation system that happens. So a lot of patients, so there is a clinical way to get this, right? And as I said, I get this question a lot. People have heard about these spec scans. They want to go and pay all sorts of money to have a spec scan done to look. I just want to see. I want to know what's going on. Well, I don't think you're going to get the answers that you actually are looking for. And I'm going to kind of break this down. So a systematic review from Lynn uh, a number of years ago found that when they looked at patients with concussion, spec scans were showing differences in cerebral blood flow uh, one month after injury, all the way up to five and a half years after the injury. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, there it is. They're going to be able to see something and show something. The most common areas for perfusion deficits were the frontal lobes. Uh, 40 to 50 percent of patients had areas had issues in the frontal lobes. 30 to 40 percent of patients in across all of these studies had issues in the temporal lobes. Some studies also found reduced uh, perfusion in the basal ganglia, which is an area of the brain associated with the thalamus and is involved in the coordination of movement. So the problems, however, so you might be sitting there thinking about, um, you know, should I get this done? So that is the question that we're here to answer. There's four main problems with the spec scan, which means that they're not ready yet for clinical use. Number one is that the findings on spec scan don't necessarily correlate with the symptoms that people experience or cognitive function testing. So just because you feel that you have memory impairments and all these different things, if they test you on neuropsychological testing and try to show all of these, you know, different areas of, of uh, functional deficits, and then you do a spec scan, the findings on the spec scan don't necessarily correlate with the problems that you're having. So if you think that this is going to be a way to figure out why something's going on or where something is an issue, it's not necessarily going to be able to show that. Problem number two, concussion symptoms are non-specific, meaning that if you have a concussion or PCS, it looks very similar to other types of injuries or mental health conditions. All right, so concussion has very similar, almost actually identical in all of the studies that have been done, very similar identical symptoms to whiplash or neck injury. All right, so just keep that in mind. Very similar identical findings to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, inflammatory conditions, chronic fatigue. There's a whole bunch of things that overlap and look and feel just like concussion, all right? So just because you feel that you're not able to concentrate as well as you were, just because you have headaches, all of these different things doesn't necessarily mean that this is related to concussion because, like I said, concussion is a non-specific thing. The symptoms look very much like a number of different conditions. Problem number three, the functional deficits experienced in concussion are very similar to other con conditions. If you take a concussed person and compare them to a normal, healthy, uninjured person, no injuries of any kind, you will see differences between them. The concussed patient will show deficits in a variety of different areas. But research done looking at patients in the emergency department in the acute stages of injury find that if you compare somebody with concussion to somebody with a musculoskeletal injury of some other kind, so let's say you take you know, concussions and you compare them to people with uh, you know, a broken leg or an ankle sprain or something like that, you will not be able to tell the difference between those two conditions. So the functional deficits oftentimes experienced by concussion patients are not necessarily specific to concussion either. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of research to kind of show this. Same with things like PTSD. If you take PTSD patients, compare them to concussion patients, they look very similar on all of their neuropsychological testing, their symptom profiles, a whole bunch of different things. You can't really tell the difference between them from that perspective. Then the fourth problem is that SPECT findings are also nonspecific. 
we see findings of cerebral perfusion deficits in patients with low back pain, patients with whiplash, patients with neck pain, patients with upper thoracic pain, patients with depression, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So we now have a situation, and I'm going to kind of summarize this. This is going to be a short little episode, but I'll answer questions after. If concussion looks and feels just like PTSD, just like depression, just like anxiety, just like neck pain, just like whiplash, just like other musculoskeletal injuries, just like chronic fatigue, and SPECT imaging shows similar findings in concussion, in PTSD, in whiplash, in low back pain, uh, in neck pain, in upper back pain, in depression, in chronic fatigue, how do you know what you're actually picking up on the scanner? So what are you hoping to get out of your SPECT scan test? To put it another way, let's use an example. So you're a patient, you have all these symptoms, you want to find out why. So you heard about SPECT scanning, okay, I want to go get this SPECT scan done that can look at my cerebral blood flow, and you go and you get it done. They do the scan and they're going to find reduced blood flows. Okay, and a lot of patients are going to find this. Now, you still don't know why it's there, even after all of that. You're going to attribute it, and a lot of times the person doing the scan will say, well, this is because of concussion. But you can't draw that causative relationship because it could mean that you're depressed. It could mean that you have anxiety. It could mean that you have a neck injury. It could mean that you have other types of pain that are resulting in these blood flow issues. There's too much and too many variables that we don't yet know. We don't know what contributes to all this stuff. So I think as a research tool, and this is kind of the consensus at this point in time in the concussion world, is that as a research tool, there is definitely some promise. We know that concussion causes blood flow issues, but concussion causes injury all over the brain. So to try and find a specific pattern that is associated with concussion, then that is kind of the difficult piece, right? As we get more data, we will eventually be able to separate what is PTSD, what is concussion, what is anxiety, what is depression, what is, you know, neck pain or back pain or any other type of musculoskeletal pain. But we need that data first to be able to make the distinction to say what's actually the cause of what you're experiencing. So if you're having persistent concussion symptoms and you want to participate in a research study that's using SPECT scans, yeah, by all means, go and do it. But if you're a patient that's trying to find answers, I don't think that you're going to actually get what you're looking for because you're going to be looking for an answer as to why something is the way it is and you don't yet know. Just because there's blood flow abnormality doesn't really mean anything. How are we going to treat it? So let's say you find a blood flow abnormality on your SPECT scan. The outcome, the treatment is basically going to be the same. We need to improve cerebral blood flow. We need to do things that reduce inflammation. We need to do exercise to improve cerebral blood flow. All right. So the treatment ends up being the same. And I just don't think you're going to get the answers that you're particularly looking for. So short and sweet for, our, for today's episode. Uh, but for those of you that are listening uh, or are live, I will answer some questions right now. For those of you that are watching this on YouTube, be sure to subscribe, like, all of that stuff, share with your friends, and, um, and those listening on the podcast, be sure to do the same as well. So I will shut it down there on the YouTube and the other channels, and I will take some live questions right now.